Okay, hello again. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, Peter Himes and the 80s, early, the last film was, was made in at least 1990, but it was shot in the 80s. And it was from an era of a certain sort of directors, because in the 90s, but 1990 and 81, you could feel the culture sort of slowly shift, and then by 92, 93, it really shifted. And the films made in the late 80s were no longer getting made. They've been influenced by the successful films in the late 80s and have moved to something else. And this film, these films were obviously of an era before that. So basically it's Running Scared, um, Presidio and Now Martin. These were the B-movies of the era. Peter Himes is a B-movie director. He did not get the big budgets. He did not get... He got some big stars once in a while. But he made films that were released, got decent enough reviews and then were hit... TV, and you saw them mostly on TV. You know, when I, when I was rewatching these films, I thought I hadn't seen Now and Martin, and I watched it. I've seen this film. I remember all the stuff in it. <laughs> you know, and it's a film where it's taking stuff from other films too. So Peter Himes is never a director who was stunningly original. He was a B movie director. And he's still alive, but he, in his era, he made B movies. Some, I mean, some of them are better than others. I read Outland, which Rodin has talked about endlessly to, to a point where um, you really want to say we shut up about Outland. He's, he, he goes that far about Outland, as you probably know if you watch his channel. Um, he made 2010, The Secret 2001, which is a decent enough film, but not in the same league as 2001. It's like a kind of pulpy reboot, which I really enjoy. I've, I've read all the 2001 sequel novels. It's a good adaptation of that novel. But it wasn't needed, but it's still very enjoyable to have. You know, he did um, Capricorn 1, which is a paranoid thriller about um, what the astronauts didn't go to space. Which is a silly film, but it's enjoyable. It's an enjoyable paranoid film. He made a bunch of other stuff like Hanover Street and things like that. He wrote some films. But he's one of those directors that was always bubbling on the surface. He was a director who got the projects the big directors didn't get. Like, if a lot of the big directors, the established directors, Sidney Pollock turned it down. And then people who were more of the new wave, like like De Palma, turned it down. You know, eventually those kind of projects, or Lumet would turn it down. Eventually those kind of projects would probably find a way to Peter Helms. Or he would write them himself and get funding. But they were like the projects that these other directors, even if they offered to them, would say no because they were basically, they had decent enough character beats. The plots were okay but not amazing. But they were just enjoyable B-movies. But he was never going to get the big assignments. He got 2010, but everyone else had turned it down because everyone else thought, this is, no, I'm not doing this. You know, this is suicide. Um, so, he's kind of that kind of director. He got assignments. When he got to the big budget stuff, he got assignments that no one else wanted or he would write his own and he'd get funding, but at a lower level. So, Outland looks great for the budget. He got Sean Connery uh, post-Bond before he did a big comeback, but it still was a nice... Even then, Connery was still a movie star. He wasn't like a top level star when he became again in the mid-80s. But he was still a decent draw. So he could get those kind of actors. He could get Gene Hackman before Unforgiven. He could get actors who were good, who could elevate the material. But they weren't the top level. We got Michael Douglas for Star Chain, but before Douglas really became a big name. is He could get actors who were either on their way up or on their way down. Or floating pretty well in the middle range and they were pretty comfortable. You could never get the big stars of the time. So when you worked with Schwartz, now you worked some work with him after his peak. You know. His, his peakest peak actor was John claude Van Damme for the Time Cop and Sudden Death. That was Van Damme near his peak when he worked with him. But the best Van Damme we gave was Peter Himes. It's that, he's that kind of director. He's a B-movie director. Which is fun because I enjoy B movies, but you can you can get enough of them, especially if you watch three of them for the same director within a week. 
and you can see the limitations and the, and the charms pretty clearly. So the first one is uh, Running Scared, which was made after 2010, which had not done well, and Hems wanted to do a film that was nothing to do with ton, nothing to do with special effects. So they, so they sent him this film that no one else wanted, called Running Scared, about these cops who were older cops who wanted to retire. So Hems took the idea, rewrote the script and had it, made the cops younger, and it made it people, two cops who had the idea of retiring and resting that, and then decided to change their mind. But the idea was them trying to survive up until the day they retired and take down this guy and then realising at the end of it, they don't really want to retire. They want to keep going as cops. So, it's a fun idea. They get Billy Crystal and Gregory, H Gregory Hines as the two cops. It's a typical white cop, black cop. In this case, Jewish cop, black cop. Which had been popularised with Eddie Murphy and Nick Nolte in 40 Hours. And this was one of those 40 Hours, in the wake of 40 Hours in movies, where it can look gritty because 40 Hours look gritty. It can have swearing, it can have bad behaviour by the cops. So it was kind of a riff on French connection, kind of bad behaviour by cops, which had been known in the 70s and 80s. It could be wackier comedies with bad behaving cops. Before that, line kind of fell away. I mean, it was it was pulled back up by Lethal Weapon in the late 80s. But this film came before that. So this was like the kind of one of those films between the two big, you know, films of that type, which were 40 Hours and uh, Lethal Weapon. And it's not as good as either, but it's still enjoyable. So you get, you get a weird Jimmy Smith as a villain performance in this one. He's going to try to track down. You get a young Joe Pantolano in it. You have Stephen Bauer from Scarface with her beard in it. And you get Billy Crystal being wacky. You get his partner, Gregory Hines, being wacky. They become too wacky at times. And it's trying too hard sometimes to be a wacky comedy. And the plot doesn't make sense because Jimmy Smith keeps on getting caught and getting released by the cops so they can do a bit more of the plot. And it's like, why don't you just keep him in jail? I don't care how what his lawyer is, he'd be in jail long term for all of that stuff. So that's a p plot issue that's a problem. You know. But it doesn't matter. But it's one of those films that's just like it's there, it's enjoyable and I hadn't seen it from the 80s and I probably won't watch it again for a very long time because we watched it, it reminded me of what the film was, it was a film I watched for quite a few times in the 80s, it was silly, but it was trying to be these other 40 hours, it was trying to be Beverly Hills Cop, but it wasn't that, it was just a, it was just a riff on that kind of popular film, and it's enjoyable, but it's very slapdash, it's too many obvious gags, it's too many silly gags, it's obvious influenced by like, Saturday Night Live kind of wackiness, and it becomes great in some time. There's a lot of times where it goes from silly to being in the cold streets of Chicago. I you might take it seriously for a bit before they do another wacky joke. And it's like, it's enjoyable enough, but it's a tonal issue, which is irritating. Now I'm going to Presidio, which is the film that Hames made after the success of Running Scared. Now Running Scared was his, his big hit of the 80s. Even though it wasn't a massive hit, it did well. So he had a bit more power, really. So he did The Presidio, which was written by Larry Ferguson, who did a lot of Paramount films at the time, like Beverly Hills Cop 2 and Top Gun. So this is one of the big films. And it, it set up the idea that would end up being the kind of um, NCIS stuff. Because it started Mark Harmon, who would go on to do all that stuff as well. So it was like a big studio interest film. Paramount, Sean Connery, who'd just come off the Oscar with um, Untouchables, so it was a big studio thing. Um, it didn't do very well. It was kind of like the film that Hems had a bit of leeway because of the success of Running Scared, and then this one kind of put him back to B-movie territory. Because it's a film that's more enjoyable in parts than it is in the whole the basic problem is the conspiracy plot in the centre of it is fairly predictable 
and fairly easy to spot. So there's no real momentum to the investigation. So the script needed work. The actual character stuff's kind of obvious, but it's enjoyable. Sean Connery plays a guy who is the head MP of the area where someone gets killed. Mark Harmon, because they, the car chase it, they end up taken out into the main street of San Francisco where this film's set. Mark Harmon is a, a cop there who used to be an MP on the base who have and Connery don't like each other very much. So they've got the, the clashing, like, the cliché thing of two guys don't like each other have to get on. And it follows all the, the beats, really. But it does it enjoyably, because Connery knows what he's doing. Mark Cameron, on the other hand, is kind of so-so in this film. He's like, he's basically... Well, well first of all, the rumour is that, um, that the people wanted Sam Neill. And they got Mark Harmon. But Mark Harmon was a big new thing from TV. So they tried the new t TV guy. See if he became a movie star. He didn't. After this film that was it. The experiment was over. It was like nope. You can't really do that. But. Um, he went back to TV. And had his good TV career. But it was kind of the thing is. You kind of feel that. There's a. There's an imbalance of actors. There's like. Sam Neill would have been a much better choice. This part. Because he would have been really. Pushed back against Connery. And the other, we see Hunter October two years later when they're both together. It's like, they do have a good chemistry together as actors. So it was like, that's kind of a shame that he wasn't there. Meg Ryan is in it as well, playing Connery's daughter, who plays a bit of a nut. She's she's a bit of a lunatic. But it's a fun part, and she seems to do what she can with the part. Again, all the actors in this, apart from Harmon, put more into the parts than they actually need to. They actually do are trying. I mean, Jack Warden is a pal of Connery's who they have their old warrior scenes talk to each other, which again is a cliche, but they're enjoyable. I mean, the thing thing with this film is it's a B movie where all the cliches are enjoyable. They're done well with people who know how to do them. And it's a film that's easily rewatchable. It's an enjoyable film I saw a few times in the 80s on video, and I could see why I enjoyed it. The, the worst part of the film is actually the investigation and action scenes because. The least interesting parts. The stuff with Connery is the best bits. The bits by Harmon himself, the worst bits. It's just one of those films that's not quite there. And it's done by a director who... You just have a feeling that um, a stronger director would not have let some of that stuff pass. Like they would have said, no, we need a better final third. We need a better revelation of who the villains are and why they're doing this stuff. And we need a strong leading man. Your feeling is that this was a studio effort and compromises were made that actually made the film much worse than it should have been. Because it is enjoyable. It's one of those films that is enjoyable. The action scenes are are okay. They're not great, but they're okay. They're well shot. It's just that um, one thing I'm not about hiding with action scenes is it throws action scenes in there and sometimes they're they're not that engaging because they have no real connection to the characters. The way that James Cameron does or a lot of good action directors John McTiernan does where there's action, but they're tied to the character's motivation, so you feel invested. This time, these are action scenes that are happening, things are happening. And a lot of time, they don't involve the lead characters, which is a problem <laughs> in an action scene. The big action scene, again, does not involve any of the lead characters. And towards the end, the action scenes are just talking stuff with a lot of older character actors in an action scene does not make for excitement. And if you don't have the drama there to make it work as a drama with some action in the background that doesn't work either because they go for the full action thing and it doesn't it's not a good combination so they so the plotting and the action stuff always goes in the way in this film but it's still enjoyable it's just one of those films that the the, the flaws bring it down and everyone's trying to make it better than it is but it's still an enjoyable professional b movie and it, didn't do well, but it did probably do as well as it should have because it really was. It set up a TV show that it really felt like a TV show that was in a big budget Hollywood film. The final film I'm talking about is Narrow Margin, which is a remake roughly of The Narrow Margin with Richard Fleischer. It stars Gene Hackman and Anne Archer, and it's enjoyable. It's, that's it, it's enjoyable. There's nothing in this film that's unique, there's just nothing here that's unique. But it is well done because Gene Hackman's in it. Gene Hackman can make some of the more 
cliched stuff work just by charm and by experience. And this is the big example of a, an early action scene that disconnects entirely because there's a scene early on where the the characters of Teen Hammer's character meets Anna Archer and suddenly they're, they're chased by the villains after going to the train. And it's a big action scene, but it has continu continuity errors and it's not that engaging because it's uh, they're chasing an older guy and it's like, well, there's no way he'd survive this, so I'm just disengaged. The, the, the action doesn't meet the age of the character, so you just know it's just an empty action scene. And it's like, no one figured this out early. Like, you can't put a young, an older guy in this action scene expecting to survive. But there's some nice stuff. There's JT Walsh turns up early as a part of a doomed guy who gets shot quickly, and he's, his death is the thing that Anna out of spots, and she can finger the one of the gangsters that all, all the people are after. So Hackman has to find her. Once they find her, he has to get her on a train to get her back to an airport to get her back to LA to testify. He has to convince her to testify because she knows that she's a target and she's protecting other people. And Hackman just to convince her, as well as avoid all the there's, there's assassins in the train. There's two that he knows of, and there's one that he doesn't know of. He's trying to who the other one is, and it's obvious who the other one is pretty much as soon as you see them. But it's still well done. I mean, you know what's going on. So when I mean, that's the problem is you know what's going to happen. The good part is you can enjoy it still because Gene Hackman's so good. And it's done professionally. I mean, there's nothing unique about the setup. And Brian De Palma would do a lot more in 20 minutes than any Mission Impossible than this film does in the whole running time. <laughs> you know. Uh, but the actors are fine. Hackman has a really good scene with the assassins where they're talking. And Hackman has another good scene with Archer and he's trying to convince her. So Hackman's always getting lots of good scenes with people. And he gives a human touch to all that stuff. But it's a basic film. It's a B-movie. That's it. It's a B-movie. It, it came out, didn't do that great. Then then pretty much hit the uh, market of TV and cable. And that's where it really belongs. I mean, I, I watched a projector. There's nothing in the film that's, right, is, that's you know, this jumps out as really that cinematic. You don't lose that much on the um, on the small screen. This one, it's it's just a B movie. It's fun, it's fun, but it's pretty disposable. You're quick to forget about it. I actually had seen this film, forgot it existed, and then as soon as it was watched, I remember stuff. I was like, oh, that's where that death came from. I remember the death. I don't remember the film it came from, and it came from this one. It's just that kind of film. But it's enjoyable. It's just Himes makes in that even made enjoyable films that were not amazing, but they were enjoyable. Later on, his career went on to stuff like End of Days, which was pretty awful, and his kind of careers kind of just fell away after that. This was probably the end of his better period, where in the nineties, I think he went on to films and types of films where he think had less emotional investment. He was just trying to do a job. That is my sense of the film, they feel less personal, less b movie in a way that is better, as a as film in the 80s where I've kind of B-movies, but enjoyable B-movies. That's kind of the way we left it, and his son, John Himes, is a good director. He does B-movies too, but I think his stuff's got a more ambition to them, and they're tighter, and they're, they've got a bit more zest to them. I like them, I really like the John Himes films. So, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it interests you. I just thought this was a nice little B-movie, 80s B-movie thing that actually would be of interest. He also produced Monster Squad during this time, which is a fun movie too. So, I just thought I'd mention that too. So, hope you enjoyed this video. Hope it interests you. I'll see you later. Bye. <laughs>